I think what's really, really important, I believe this with all my heart, is that we are making sure that we're passing on our faith to the next generation. And that's going to have to be intentional. Um, we invest a lot in our children's ministry. We had five, around, right around 500 children that went up, up to the mountains, spend days up there. And this, I was talking to Susie, and she was saying that, that there was a time where time was running out in our worship set, and they were sending the kids back. And even the kids' camp was saying, hey, please send the kids back to their dorm rooms. But Susie, we just felt like we need to spend a little more time worshiping. And this is what happened. She said, anybody wants to go back to your dorm rooms can, can go, go back to your dorm rooms. And the majority of the kids stayed and worshiped for another two hours in the presence of God. And, and they started doing that every single night. And one of the highlights is that they were spending time and they were seeking after. They were eating as fast as they could so they could get a front row seat to begin to worship God down there. So they weren't just having fun. They were having encounters with the Lord. Let's give the Lord a hand that we got. We're raising children that are falling in love with God's presence, which is really important. And today what we're going to do is we're going to continue talking about growth. And, and, and the subject today is love. And I would, if it was a formula, I would say this, love equals guaranteed growth. What that means, without love in our relationships, they won't grow. Without love, our ministries won't grow. Our discipleship groups won't grow. Our church won't grow. Our influence won't grow. Our spiritual maturity won't grow. Our wisdom won't grow. Our divine favor, our peace, our joy, our freedom, our, our revelation of scripture. Um, but with love, Everything grows. Uh, we need more love in this world. How many understand that? We're, we're living in a world that right now is hurting more than ever. Um, there's a lot of pain, a lot of disappointment, loneliness, abuse, neglect, and heartbreak. I just said a lot of things, but it's a reality. There's people this week that are so depressed and so hopeless that they're really contemplating. Maybe you might even be here today end in your life and it's a real condition uh, we are in a place as a society that we're lonelier than ever um, I, there was a report that suggests 36 percent of all americans including 61 percent of young adults and 51 percent of mothers with young ch children feel seriously lonely 61 percent of young adults you'd be thinking with facebook and all the all the social media opportunities to connect with somebody that we would be less lonely, but we're more lonely than we ever have been. According to this data, those ages 16 to 24 are the group most likely to report feeling lonely with 10% feeling often lonely often or always. So loneliness, loneliness is starting to become a major epidemic. And so we're, we're lonely. Um, I'll give you some more stats on loneliness. Well over 59% of those um, 85 and over and 30% of those age 75 to 84 live alone. So we not only are lonely at the younger ages, our seniors are really lonely as well. A lot of them are living by themselves. They have nobody talking to them. Uh, I was even looking at this um, stat with our Elderly, um, lo loneliness and social isolation are associated with an increased risk of developing coronary heart disease and stroke. Over a half a million older people go at least five or six days a week without seeing or speaking to anyone at all. So there's a gap. Um, we're starting to see our senior citizens um, have no visits. There's, there's no relationship. So we're becoming a lonely society. The reason I'm saying that, because um, the Bible says that in the last days, in Matthew 24, 12, says there will be more and more evil or sin or lawlessness in the world. So most people will stop showing their love for each other. The love of many and most will grow cold. So it, it's saying we're going to live in a society that's going to become more sinful. That means 
it's going to become more selfish. And this is, you have to understand the correlation. The more selfish we become and the more sinful we become, the less loving we become. And so there's going to be a correlation in the last days that there would be a huge demand for God's love. So we could say, man, this world is getting really bad. We could also notice that there's going to be a high demand for real love. And that means that we as believers, if we're walking in the love of God, we can make a huge impact. Loneliness is a problem. Our children are missing the love of their fathers. Uh, this weekend... As the children were up there last week, uh, Susie, our children's pastor, asked a question, how many of you feel like no one loves you? And this is, uh, and this is what happened. 80% of the children says, I feel no one loves me. What's going on? We're living in a society that we're busy we have things, we got cars, we got TVs, we got the latest shoes, but there's a gap. Even our children don't feel like they're loved. Only 4.3% of children are being raised by, raised by their father. It's a strikingly low number and unusual statistic. We're talking about 4.3% of all the children that are born on, uh, in the United States are actually being raised by their father. According to the U.S. Census Bureau, 19.5 million children, more than one in four, live without a father in their home. They're missing the love of a father. This is, keep on going, 72% 70 of Americans believe that a fatherless home, fatherless home is the most significant social problem and family problem that is facing our country today. 85% of youth who are currently in prison grew up in a fatherless home. So we're, 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 we're struggling with our families, keeping our families together. Now, I'm giving you some like really, like some real, real, real reports, not to depress you on this Sunday morning, to let you know that there's an answer, there's a need, and we as a church, you as a person can fulfill that need. We are also depressed. Depression is the leading cause of disability worldwide and is a major contributor to overall global burden of disease. Just think about that. Even though we, we, we know more about psychology, more about medicine, more than ever, and we have more people that specialize in the mind and thinking, and, and we have doctors that specialize in helping people have mental health, we're sicker than we ever have been mentally. It's the number one cause of disability worldwide. Seven million adults aged 65 years or older are affected by depression. Look at this. 5.8 million children, 11, point, 11 to 17 years, have been diagnosed with anxiety and 2.7 million children with depression. One more stat. Suicide was the second, look at this, leading cause of death among individuals between ages 10 and 34. Second leading cause of death between age 10 to 34 is suicide. This is where we're at. And what's the fact? Love is the answer. God's love is the answer. We were created to love. We were created to be loved. And we were created to receive and have an experience with the love of God. And if love is the answer, where is the answer? We are the answer. Love heals. Love restores us and our relationship. Love comforts. Love meets needs. Love casts out all fear. Love forgives. It gives purpose and meaning to our lives. Love fulfills us. It fills us with joy, gives us hope, and empowers us. Let's give the Lord a hand that there's hope. Love is the answer. This week at The Way, we're spreading love. Approximately we had 500 kids at our kids camp, experiencing the presence and love of God. We started an outreach this week at our Motel 6, at a local Motel 6, ministering to displaced families. There's a lot of families today that can't afford to, you know, have, they, they, they just can't afford to have a, a, an apartment. And a lot of them are being displaced with their little children. And they're at the local Motel 6. 
And we as a ministry, we started this week a ministry reaching out to those displaced moms, dads, and families. Isn't that great? That's spreading the love of Jesus. Let them know there's hope. Our children's ministry delivered groceries to hungry children in our community. Uh, as we're in kids camp and we go through our, our inner city, we're finding out there's a lot of kids that are in food insecure homes and, and they have habits of just trying to find food. Uh, this kids camp, there was a little girl that was looking through the trash to find some extra food. She didn't know she could go back and get seconds. So Susie caught her and said, what are you doing? She goes, I'm just getting some extra food. She's used to going through the trash to find extra food for herself and her family. Thank God there's a loving ministry that reaches out. And during the week, we go out there and we, get, we give groceries to food insecure homes. Come on, that's showing some love. Love is the answer. Our TJ Church this week is going, has went to a rehab center and presented the gospel and is launching our Holy Wars discipleship classes to rehab centers that are non-Christian. They don't have God in the rehab center, but we're going ahead and bringing some hope to rehab center. Not only can you be set free from a drug addiction, you could live a life of purpose filled with God's love. There's hope. Love is the answer. We introduced this. Our, our TJ campus also launch, is launch, launched this week. We're going to get, we bring, bring breakfast breakfast for children in totally impoverished areas. And when we're talking about the poverty in Mexico and the poverty in California is totally different. We're talking about there is no welfare. These kids that are literally hungry in these areas will not eat breakfast. They won't eat, period, unless we go out there with the love of God and practically go ahead and feed them. It, it, I'm letting you know, when we feed them, we're letting them know you're not forgotten, God loves you. We love you. Aren't you glad that you're part of a church that's loving some people? We believe that love is the answer. Is that right? I love that. We even launched out this week, we launched out with the leaders of our community, our employment ministry. Uh, right now, we have an employment ministry that's going to help people all over San Bernardino and the Inland Empire fill out applications and help them get qualified for jobs. And for some of them in our neighborhoods for the first time in their lives, they're going to be stepping into the employment and they're going to have a job and they're going to get off the government assistance for the first time in their life because we have an employment ministry. Isn't that great? This week, 459 of our members signed up to serve in ministry and spread God's love in our church and our community. Love is the answer. How important is love to God? Well, number one, loving God and others is the most important command that God has ever given mankind. So how important is love to God? It's the most important thing. That means it's more important than your giftings. It's more, person, more important than your personal success. It's the most important thing. And when you stand before God one day, you will give an account to how well you loved. Did you love God and love others? That question was asked thousands of years ago, Matthew 22, 36. It says, teacher, which is the most important commandment in the law of Moses? Jesus replied, who replied? Jesus. He says, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. So the first command is love me with everything that you have. And I'm going to ask you a question. Do you love God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind? That's something to think about. Because just the last part, loving God with all of your mind. You know, when you're loving God with all of your mind, how do you know you're loving God with all your mind? You're thinking about him all the time. Whatever you're thinking about, you love. Have you ever, remember, do you, some of you guys know this. Do you remember when you were in love? All you thought was about that person. See, some of you guys are smiling around. I remember. I remember when I was, no, I'm still in love, but that's kind of crazy. I almost messed it up right now. I remember when I was in love. So you're not in love. That, that'd be the conversation we go home. Were well, you not in love now? No, I love you still. 
But, but I remember walking around with Lisa's picture in my wallet. And, and when you're in love, you bring up the person in every conversation. And I remember being at work and I couldn't wait for, I, we could be talking about baseball and I say, um, I just want to let you know something. This is my girlfriend right here. I think, why are you showing us that? Isn't she pretty? I remember when we were in love. Now I said, we were still in love. You're on the phone and you never want to get off phone. You just want to hear each other breathe. You hang up. No, you hang up. God wants you to not serve him because you have to. Serve him because you don't want to go to hell. Serve him because you love him. Like I, I, he wants you to love him more than anything with all of your heart, with all of your mind, with all, with all of your strength, with all of your soul. So he commands us to do that. And he says, this is the first and greatest commandment. Second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. So he says, now what's really important for me is that you love, love me. And then you love each other as you love yourself. And what he's saying, love in others is as important as loving me. I think he's also saying, when you're loving others, you're loving me. And the word love is agapao, and it means to love dearly. It means to like and have affection for. Have you ever, like, loved someone but not liked them? Like, I love you, but I don't like you. Like, I love you because I have to. But, but God is, doesn't want us just to love, but he wants us to like him as well. And he doesn't just want us to love our wives. He wants us to like our spouse as well. He just doesn't want us to love each other. He wants us to like each other as well. I think sometimes like is more important than love. More important than love. It means also to be devoted to. That means I'm down with you. I'm devoted to you. We need some loyalty nowadays. I mean, there's a lot of disloyalty and and people, walk, people are fickle about the love. They're in and they're gone if it doesn't work out for them. But, but real love, God says, I want you to be devoted to me and devoted to one another. Is there anybody that's going to be here, here in the house of God, love your brothers and sisters in the Lord, and you're going to stick it out through thick and thin, th thick and thin, through good times and bad times. And when the going gets tough, we just get going. We just keep going. We don't give up. We don't quit. That's being devoted. It means to welcome and entertain. That's interesting about love, to welcome. Welcome, what does that have to do with? Now, I'm going to give you an example. That there's, it's a cool thing that when you walk into a room, you're celebrated. Isn't that cool? You're here. Man, give me a hug. How many like that? I mean, wow, praise God. I even like my little grandson to run to me. But it's a, it's, it's a shame when I'm over there waiting for a, a, him to run to me. He just runs right past me. Okay. But, but God wants us to love each other, but he also wants us to celebrate each other. This should be a place that you are received with a smile. We're so glad you're here. Let's welcome. And then we entertain you. We're not, you know what that means is that you're welcome. We love that you're here. And we are here for you. Should the church be that place that we love people, we smile, we celebrate that they're here, and then we take care of them? Should the church be that place? If Disneyland wants to be the happiest place on earth, and that's their goal, we should... Our desire should be to be the most loving place on earth. The church should be a place where everybody comes and they're celebrated and they're welcome and they're hugged and they're loved. They should, it should be a place that people can re finally receive a smile. Right? Come on. I love that. And it also means to be friendly to love. He goes, I want you, God said, I want to be friends with you and I want you to be friendly. And it means be excessively kind and tender to, to be content with and well-pleased with. I love that. And God wants you to say, look, I want you to love me, be well-pleased with me, that you don't need nothing else. I love that. I, I think that's super good, that I would love God so much that it doesn't matter what this world offers me. I am content with God. You could take your sinful um, temptations, keep them for yourself. I have God. 
I love that. I want my wife to be content with me. I, I'm sure she wants me to be content with her alone. And this is what God is saying. I want you to love me and love each other that you find contentment in your relationship with me and you find contentment in the relationships that you have with your brothers and sisters. Is that good? So now Jesus used the same word for love that he used love me and love one another. Jesus was just saying, the way you love me, love each other. You can't say this, I love God, but I hate people. Like, God, I love you, but I don't love your people. That's like saying, Pastor Marco, I really love you, but I hate your kids. Your kids just get on my nerves. They're so obnoxious. I mean, in one way, you'd be saying, like, I love you. In the other way, you'd be like telling me, I don't like you. And this is what God is saying. I'm using the same exact word for love because I want you to get this. I want you to understand this. The way you love me, you love each other. And if you love each other, you're loving me. How many get that? Everyone of us needs a place to be loved. Every one of us want to be loved. How many want to be loved? Come on. And if we don't find it in the right place, we'll look for love in all the wrong places. That's a country song back in the day. You guys don't even know about that song. I think it was Kenny Rogers. Looking for love in all the wrong places. You know why they're looking for love in all the wrong places? Because they're not finding it in the right place. The right place should be men and women of God that love people unconditionally with the love of God. Amen. Come on. How important is love? It's the most important thing. It's the greatest command. How important is love to God? Number two, without love, we are guaranteed to be unproductive. God is saying in scripture that if you don't have love, this is how important it is. No matter what you do, how great a gift it, gifts you have, and, and it doesn't matter how great a ministry you do, if it doesn't have love, it produces no spiritual results. Well, I'm gifted. I know you're gifted, but without love, there's no Holy Spirit. And without the Holy Spirit, there's no glory to God. And without the Holy Spirit, there's no salvation. Without the Holy Spirit, there's no healing. Without the Holy Spirit, come on. Without the Holy Spirit, there's no one getting set free. Without the Holy Spirit, you got nada. Why? Because we're living in a world that's egotistical. And even ministers have become ego egotistical. That they're doing ministry for some other reason. Maybe they're doing it because they got a position and they think it's, it's all. And, and Jesus said, look, if you want to be a leader of all, be a servant of all. This is not about you being a boss. This is about you being a servant. And if you, do, do, if you don't do it in the right spirit, I want you to understand this. I will not endorse you. Look at 1 Corinthians 13.1. It says, if I could speak all the languages of the earth, like, I don't know anybody could speak all the languages of the earth, but let's just say you could. Like every language. We go to Japan and you're speaking Japanese. We go to Africa and you're speaking their language. We go to Mexico, you're speaking Spanish. I mean, you go to Russia, you're speaking Russian. And like whatever language they come up with, I know that. Man, that'd be a pretty powerful gift. If you spoke all the languages of the earth and of angels, but didn't love others, but didn't love others, I would only be a noisy gong, gong or a clanging cymbal. What he means, all the talk and all the rhetoric and all the conversation would not make an impact. It would just be a whole bunch of noise because they don't have love. And what he's saying is they would read your attitude before they understand your words. So our words need to make sure, our words need to be wrapped up in love. Tell the truth, but tell the truth in love. Truth without love is no, it's just a gonging symbol. No one's listening to you until they know you love them. Well, it's the truth, I know, but there's no love. And if there's no love, it's just a whole bunch of clang, 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 nothing. I didn't understand what you just said because I, there's one message that you're trying, you're trying to get me information, but I understand this. I don't even get the idea that you love me yet. 
This community, if we're going to reach our community, the first thing that they need to know, we absolutely love you. We don't want nothing from you. We want to give you what we've received from God and the same love and the same forgiveness and acceptance that God gave us. We just want to give you. And when they get that message, they'll hear our conversation. I would only be the client. If I had the gift of prophecy and if I understood all God's secret plans, and possess all knowledge. And if I had such faith that I could move mountains, but didn't love others, I would be nothing. What? Faith that moves mountains? Yeah, you could, you could have faith that moves mountains. You could be the master prophet. I know everything. Present, past, future. I know every detail of word of knowledge over your life. It doesn't matter. That's a gift from God. And gifts from God are without repentance. That means you could be a gifted singer and not be moving anybody's heart and making any spiritual impact. You could have a gift of prophecy, but what God is saying, without love, you're nothing. You're nothing. That word nothing is a very strong word. It means useless. It means obsolete. It means falling into a category of disuse. It means a zero. It means you add no value. You make no spiritual impact. You're of no importance. You're a nada, a nobody, insignificant, a small potato. <laughs> what do you mean? That if you have all these gifts and you don't have love, this is the problem. In the spiritual realm, there's no authority. First of all, God's not endorsing you. And the reason he can't endorse, he can't endorse something without his spirit. For him to say you could use your gift and still I'll endorse you, I'll bless you, would be a father that's mistraining his children. We're misrepresenting God. We are here to show God to the world. And one of the ways we show God to the world is our love. The proof that you have God is that you have love in your heart. How many get that? Come on. I, I just want to understand that. I want to get back to the foundation of this whole thing is that this world needs love and they're going to get this love that they're looking for. They can't get it from the, come on, they can't get it from their friends. They can't get it from their gangs. They can't get it from their club. They can't get it at the casino. They can't, come on, they can't get it through, they can't get it through the hood. They're looking for some love. They can't get it through sex with, uh, with, with whoever they're having sex with and saying, I love you. We're making love. The truth is you're still empty after it's all said and done. And what God is saying, the love that the world is looking for has to come from believers. It's the only thing that's going to make them complete. People need some love. They don't just need love. They need the love of God. And without love, it don't matter how gifted you are, it doesn't produce any results. Nothing. The enemy knows that if he can conquer our love, he can strip us of our effectiveness, impact the spiritual authority. The entire spiritual realm is aware of our love walk. Doing ministry without love is doing it without the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, the, whole, the spiritual realm, say, someone say spiritual realm. They know when you walk into a room, if you come in with the Spirit of God. You could come with your gift and they could care less because everybody's gifted. But when you come with love, the Spirit of God, it causes, the Bible says, God's perfect love casts out fear. What that means is that when, when you show up with love, you show up with the Holy Spirit. And when you show up with the Holy Spirit, you show up with authority. And the spiritual realm, demons recognize that you're in the Spirit. But they could also tell when you show up with pride. Show up with anger. Show up with bitterness. Like, I can't stand that sister at church. Do you understand? You could say you can't stand the sister church or you could be the master complainer of our church and, and get this, you're still saved, but you're totally ineffective. And in the spiritual realm, you're a zero. God don't acknowledge you and the devil don't acknowledge you. You're a no impact person. 
and you got conquered by someone's bad attitude. Come on, Christians. You're going to have more love than someone have a bad attitude. They talk about you and you lose your love. Amen. Come on. You know what's so great about this? That God can use anybody that's just full of his love. We're so, nowadays, we're so into talent and position that people are, are, they want position, they want fame, but all of that is selfish ambition. They don't want to love. See, I don't want you to be known by how talented you are. I want you to be known. I want our church to be known how loving we are. That the way we're allowed to be a place that one thing for sure, you're going to receive the love of God. You don't want to be a small potato in this whole thing. <laughs> without love, let's talk about, uh, let's talk about love. Without love, we are guaranteed to be unproductive. Without love, we're nothing. We just covered that. But without love, we gain nothing. There's a saying in the gym, no pain, no gain. You understand that. You're not going to gain muscle if you're running from pain in the gym. But I think it's almost like that in life as well. If you can't get through the painful times, you can't get to the game. I've learned this, that every struggle and every dream and every vision and everything you want to accomplish in life comes with some pain attached to it. And that's why you need some faith. You need to get through the painful part to get to the game. I'm going to get that. Come on. Some of you guys right now got married. Or you got married and you went through the, to the wedding part. That was the fun part. And then you realize that the person you married is causing you some pain. But I want a better marriage. Well, you're going to have to get through the pain. You're going to have to grow through the pain. You're going to have to endure through the pain so you can get to the game. See, we're living in a world that wants the game, but they don't want the pain. So what are we talking about? I'll tell you this. No love. That's the other, this is what we're saying. No game. Not only do we gain nothing without love, those that we're ministering to gain nothing. God gets no glory. When I go into the neighborhood and, I, and I'm going to pretty soon, I'm going to be going at least once a week to L.A. and Compton, and I'm going to the toughest projects we could find, I'm going to go in. They don't know I'm a pastor I'm not going to wear a, a little badge that says, I'm Pastor Marco. <laughs> Better respect me. They're going to say, take your badge, throw it away. It means nothing in this hood. The only credibility is going to be the endorsement of God. And if I don't have endorsement from God, there, I could go into the hood and I could get killed. I could get taken out. I could get beat up. But when I have endorsement, there's something about God endorsing me. He starts talking to their hearts and say, this guy's no joke. He's for real. He really loves you. So that's what I could go with. I'm going to hide behind love. I say, Pastor, what are you going to do now? I'm gonna, uh, what are you going to do? I'm going to break down the truth. No, I'm not. That's not my main goal. I'm going to break down the truth. I'm gonna, we're going to open blind eyes today. That's not what we're doing. The first thing that I'm going to do, for God so loved the world that he gave his for only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him will not perish, have everlasting life. Understand it ends with everlasting life, but it starts with God loving. See, we want people to have everlasting life, and God says the precursor for someone to receive Jesus is they have to see Jesus, and they have to see his love in you. Well, what if they're mean? That's when love really shines. What if they persecute you? That's where love really works. And, and do you know what's crazy about this? At times, what God does is have us practice with each other in the church. And this is what the idea is. If you can't love your brothers and sisters in your church or love your church or love the people in your own house, you, you're not qualified to go out there and love some sinners. Your test to be effective out there is if, whether you could be effective in here. 
I like the world. I want to save the whole world. I want to reach all those game bangers. I want to reach all those prostitutes. You can't even love your husband. You can't even love your mother-in-law. My mother-in-law, does she count? Yeah, she's human. Well, I didn't know that. Right? You got to love your pastor. I love you guys. There's nobody here I don't absolutely love. There's nobody, oh, I don't love that person. I love every single person here. I love every person. I said, well, how can you do that, Pastor? We got issues. We got faults. So I do. So do, so do I and so do you. Are, are you looking for to love people that have no issues or faults? Love is not powerful when you're loving people with no issues or faults. Love is powerful when you're loving people that have faults just like you. Come on, is there anybody that's saying God loved me while I was yet a sinner? I'm just going to pass on the favor to somebody else. It's not time for me to magnify their faults and their shortcomings because if you do that, you're going to be unloving. Well, do you know that sister so-and-so, she has this problem? <laughs> Duh! And did you know you have a gossip problem? <laughs> Duh! That's like a doctor talking to a nurse. Did you know that person just came in is sick? Duh! This is a hospital. Come on. People have issues. They're in church. Duh! This is a hospital. This is a place where sinners, come on, are loved into wholeness and freedom and new beginnings. If they can't be loved here, there's no other place for them to go. You know, sister so-and-so, she's losing her mind. What do you say? She's crazy? Oh, wow. I didn't know there's a mental illness in the church. Come on. How many know that God's not giving us a spirit of, po of fear, but power, love, and a sound mind? If someone needs some soundness of mind, this is a place that God's love can heal their mind. Come on. This is what it's all about. Going out there loving some people. Before you become a preacher, become a lover. So without love, there's no gain. That means there's no profit. No usefulness. No, to no advantage. It, it will, there's no victory. No prevailing. No breakthrough. No benefit. Without love. You know why this is important? Because some of us are trying to reach people in our family. And God is saying... Before they hear what you have to say, may they get the message that you love them no matter what. And maybe this is a season of not talking so much and just showing some love. And if they could get sold that you love them, I believe they'll open up to the message of Jesus Christ. But people need proof that there's God. Well, what's the proof that there's God? There's a God. What's the proof, proof that Jesus lives? It's his love in us. If we act just like everybody else acts, they tell us off, we tell them off. It doesn't mean that you're not saved. It just means that you're totally ineffective and you'll never see gain. You'll never be an advantage to somebody. You'll never be a benefit to anybody because you're too angry, you're too emotional, and you're too fleshly. But I know the scripture. I know you know the scripture, but you act like the devil. Not smiling. So it's possible to start off with love and be profitable and end up with no love. In Revelation 2, 2, it says this, I know all the things you do. Someone say, God knows everything we do. I've seen your hard work. You see me hard work? You know what I do? He goes, yeah, man, I see you working hard. Like if this conversation started, I would love this conversation. You see me working hard? He goes, I sure do. He goes, and your patient endurance. He goes, you see that I have endurance too? He goes, yeah. Do you see that? Yeah, you don't give up, man. You don't quit. You're, you stick with it. And I know you don't tolerate evil people. Like, 
You know, when you see evil, that like, you address it. Like, that's, you see that? He goes, I see that. I see everything you do. You have examined the claims of those who say they are, they are apostles, but, you're, but are not. So you're even good at, 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 at recognizing false doctrine, false preachers. As a matter of fact, you got a PhD in finding out who ain't right and who's right and who's wrong, what teaches right and what teaches wrong. You got it all together. You're good at it. But I have this complaint against you. You have even patiently suffered through suffered for me without quitting. He goes, but I got this complaint against you. You don't love me and each other as you did at first. You started out with love, but now you're doing the same things you used to do, but I'm complaining about you. Look how far you've fallen. Turn back to me and do the works you did at first. If you don't repent... I will come and remove your lampstand from its place among the churches. Like, Jesus, wait, wait, wait. I thought we were starting out good here. I suffer. I'm a hard worker. Yeah, you could be religious and have no love. You could be self-righteous, know the scripture, and know all doctrine, know all theology. But it all cancels out to becoming a zero if you have no love. Because all that, what God is saying without love misrepresents me. And he says, if you don't repent of that, if you don't like say, okay, I repent for being prideful, hurtful, angry, unforgiven, self-centered, religious, self-righteous, judgmental, slandering others, using manip being manipulative, lying, lust, abusive, addictions, apathy, hardness of heart. Lord, I ask forgiveness for that. He goes, unless you do that, acknowledge that somewhere you lost your love. And I really believe this is a time for us to kind of see where we're at. Because we've been 18 years of ministry. We've got to make sure that we didn't start off super loving and somehow lost the love on, on the way through. Well, that's, that could never happen to me. It happened to them. This Ephesian church. And, and God was saying, look, if you don't repent of this, I'm going to remove your lampstand. Now, the lampstand represented light. The purpose of the lampstand is to shine light. The purpose of the lampstand was point people to the light or point people to Jesus. So the lampstand would point people to Jesus. Would it point to what? So when we're walking in love, we're shining light. The men will shine your light for, so men can see your good works. And then glorify your Father in heaven. That means everything that we do in love points to Jesus. That's why we could go into an area that's completely atheist, a whole bunch of non-believers, and just go in there and love people. And by the time we're done loving that community, people are going to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior. But it all started with feeding someone that was hungry. It all started with a big brother being there for a kid in the neighborhood that had no father. It all started with us helping a kid get ready for school. He had no school clothes, and we as a church went into a neighborhood and got him some school clothes, so he went to school feeling good about his first year. All of that is love. He goes, but if you don't repent of this, I'm going to remove your lamp thing. What that means is you will no longer be able to represent me. You know, what that means, I will no longer refer people back to your church. So it's possible to do the same works we've done in the past and be a dead church with no Holy Spirit. Isn't that crazy? Don't forget, I'll tell you, let's not forget where we came from. Don't get to the point that because God has made you successful, you forgot where you were before you came to God. Forget, don't forget how much mercy and grace was shown to you when you kept messing up and messing up and messing up. And there was a church and there were brothers and sisters that didn't judge you, but they said, come on, get back up. I believe in you. Come on, you are called by God. I believe just like God believed in me. I believe in you. And now you've overcome. But be careful as you overcome that you forget and become prideful and judgmental and unappreciative. 
Man, I tell you what, you cannot be loving if you've lost your appreciation. You think you've outgrown serving God in a church? You think you've outgrown sitting down and listening and being instructed with the word of God that all of a sudden you got so much theology in your head from YouTube? <laughs> that you need no accountability now? Is that where you're at? What happened to you? Do you see how far you've fallen? You become a critic now, church critic? Like what, a, what gift is that? I got, the, I got the church critic anointing. <laughs> what I do is criticize pastors and, you know, that Benny Hinn, he, I know he ain't right. <laughs> Stephen Furtick, oh, he's worse. And Joel Osteen, well, forget it. <laughs> now, you could go ahead and become the church critic and think that's an anointing. Understand, why worry about those people? They're not your pastor. Your job is not to pastor them. Let's fo focus on our own home. Let's focus on our own life. Let's focus on our own church. Let's focus on our own study of the word of God. And let's just make sure that we're walking in love. Because you know what's so crazy? You're going to be surprised that those people you're complaining about are going to be in heaven with you. How'd they get in? Because of my grace, dummy. Just like you got in. <laughs> you think you got in because you're so good and you're so doctrinally correct. You're saved because of one thing. You called him my son and he died for you and you recognize that, that there was no, nothing you could do to save yourself, but God's love reached down in your dark condition when nobody else wanted nothing to do with you. And he reached down and he said, son, I love you. I sent my son for you. If you believe in him, I'll save you. I'll forgive you. I'll give you purpose and fill your heart with my love let's all stand up man I got I got it just start we're just getting worked up how many receive something from God now I'm gonna tell you this I'm gonna go into this love thing in the next few weeks because you don't want to miss nothing um I'm gonna cover how do we start walking in love you don't want to know this stuff if it's the greatest command in the Bible to love God and love others, we're going to find out how to do this stuff. Um, we're going to, uh, we're going to also, and we're going to find out the different types of love. Because, you know, we're, we're, we're in a time where people say love is love and they don't understand there's all kinds of different love. And there's some love that's very selfish. And if you don't know the kind of love that's actually be an exchange, you might mistake the love as something good and it's actually something manipulative. Amen? So we're going to cover all those things in the next few weeks. I'm going to talk about the different types of love that are out there and we're going to find out the most important love, which is obviously the love of God, but we're going to find out how powerful the love of God is. How many want to find out how powerful the love of God is? It'll make you relevant everywhere you go. I love it. Everywhere I go, I come with the love of God. I don't even have to know the language. It can feel my love. Hola. I said, me glad to see you. They don't even know what I'm saying, but that sounds good to me. Like if I could still, there's a love language I'm feeling here. Right? Have you, have you ever talked to someone who doesn't know your language and they're smiling to you? You're like, and you say, I like you. I don't know. I don't know what you just said. But I like you. And you know why? Because you feel that they appreciate you being there. They welcome you. And we're living in a world that feels so unwelcomed. May the church never be a place that people come and they feel unwelcomed. And if people feel unwelcome in our church, whose fault is it? It's ours. I don't believe that's our goal. I don't believe that's happened. I don't hear that. But let's make sure that we're aware of your family, your friends. They really do need some love before they need you preaching to them. And I'm not saying don't preach. Preach. But make sure you love them first. That you ate one message. Son, I love you. Daughter, I love you. I'm not going to church with you. You got it? I don't care about that right now. I just want to let you know I love you. Well, uh, what? <laughs> 
don't know how to react to that. Like, ah, okay. You're going to short circuit people. Or they're mean to you at work. And you still show, smile. Say, bro, it's okay. I still love you, man. We're good. I wouldn't forgive me. I know you wouldn't. But God forgave me, and I'm going to give you one. I'm going to pass on what he did for me. How many understand? And then they start, wait, wait, wait a second. There's something different. We're gonna have Pastor, I'm going to have Pastor Christian close this out right now. But this is an opportunity for you to receive this, Jesus. And if you receive Jesus, I'm going to give you a key, key, key point. You get, you receive Jesus. He fills your heart with what you've been looking for. Love. It's the craziest thing. That after you receive Jesus, the Bible says in Romans 5.5, 5, we'll probably cover that next week a little bit. In Romans 5.5, 5, that the Holy Spirit comes, God's Spirit, God's Spirit fills your heart with love. Wow. There's some of you right now have never been filled with love because you've been filled with hurt, pain, depression, anxiety, thoughts of failure. That's all you know. And you've tried everything to feel that emptiness in you. And I'm telling you, I don't care what you do. I don't care what you accomplish, how much money you make, who you're with. If you don't experience the love of God, you're still going to be empty. I, I just seen something the other day. Do you know in New York, they have a billionaire's row? Have you seen that? Where they have, they have some apartment, or a, like big apartment complex or whatever, which are townhomes or whatever, and they buy them. One of them, hundred. I've seen it this week. One hundred and sixty-nine thousand, one hundred sixty-nine million dollars for an apartment. Look over and over in New York, and then with they're like all of them are basically bought from top to bottom, and this is what they're finding out. Nobody lives in them. <laughs> so they're buying supposedly what's best out there, and the places are empty. <laughs> all I'm saying. You could get to the top of this world and everything that it offers. If you don't have the love of Jesus, you're empty. You could be way more rich than them if you have Jesus. Christian, close this out, please. Let's give the Lord a hand. He's a good God. Come on, he's loving. Church, how many received that word this morning? Well, without love, we have nothing. Before we leave today, this is the most important moment we come to. We have the opportunity to receive the love of Jesus Christ. You know, the Bible says that all of us, we start off on the same playing field. We start off, we're born into sin. The Bible says that the wages or the price of sin is death. And you want to know that all of us owe that price because we've sinned and we've fallen short. I know I've sinned. I know this person next to you has sinned. We've all fallen short. But because we owe this price of death, there's no, where's the hope? Where's the answer? Well, God made a way where he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die on our behalf and to pay that price. This is the greatest example of love that the world has ever seen. It's Jesus giving his life for you and I. So whoever puts their faith in Jesus, not in their own good works, not in how often they come to church, even not, not how many good things, good deeds they do, but puts their faith in what Jesus has done. They repent of their sins and turn to God. Today, you can be saved. You can be forgiven of your sins and you can have a brand new start this morning. I wanna ask if today you wanna make a decision to follow Jesus and to put your faith in him and knowing that if you were to die today, that you would go to heaven for eternity with God. There's only one or two places we can go when we die. We either go to heaven or we go to hell. And it never changes. We stay there for eternity. And it all comes down to this one thing. Where did you put your faith? Today, let's put our faith in Jesus Christ. Let's make him the Lord of our lives. When I count to three, I want you to raise your hand if you're saying, that's me. I want to put my faith in Jesus today. When I count to three, boldly raise your hand this morning. One two, three. You're saying, that's me. I want to put my faith in Jesus. I see your hand. I see your hand over here. I see your hand. I see your hands right there. I see your hands back there. I see all four of your hands back there. 
I see your hand right there. I see your hand. I see your hand. I see your hand. I see your hand. If you raise your hand this morning, could you do one more bold step? Could you do us a favor? Come make your way out of your seat and come up here so we can pray with you and encourage you. And church, let's applaud everybody who's coming up this, this moment. This is the moment where we get excited, church. We pray, we've prayed for them all week to get saved. We've prayed for this moment right here for them to give their life to the Lord. Come on, church. Let's clap it up for everyone that's coming forward right now. Yes. If you raise your hand, come on up. We want to pray with you. Yes. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. We're proud of you. We're proud of you. Good job. They're still coming up. Let's give them a hand, church. Let's celebrate them this moment. This is what this moment is all about. And what's so great is we have young and old and everyone up here that needs Jesus. Right now, everyone who's up here, I want you to just look at me for a second. Everyone who's up here, just for a moment. We're going to help you. We're going to train you. We're going to equip you. And we're going we're gonna to do whatever it takes to help you in your walk with God. And being up here right now in this moment, it's a big step. But it's just the first step. Your next step is to get baptized. And to join a class we call Holy Warriors. And today we're going to help you sign up for that class and get discipled. And what it means to be discipled, it's just being a student, learning God's word and applying that to our life. We're going to teach you how to do that. We're not going to let you go. We're not going to abandon you. We're going to walk you through this whole process. Your next step is to get baptized and join this class. And the person in front of you, they're going to pray with you and they're going to sign you up for your next step. Are we ready to take that step today? Are we ready? Church, are we excited for them? Let's pray. Let's all bow our head and close our eyes. I don't want you to repeat after me. Say, Heavenly Father, thank you for saving me from my sin and from the penalty of sin. I believe that I've sinned against you, but I believe that you died on the cross and you rose from the dead so that I can be saved. Fill me now with your love and with your spirit. And from this moment forward, my life will never be the same because I'm living for you. Thank you for forgiving me and for saving me. My life is yours. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Can we give God praise this morning? Congratulations. Altar workers or our prayer team, they'll pray with you and they're going to help you get connected to your next step. Church, don't forget this Wednesday, we continue the end time series and we're going to answer this question. And is the rise of, of homosexuality, is that a sign of the end times? And is homosexuality a sin? You don't want to miss the end time series continuing this Wednesday. If you need church or prayer, um, if you need prayer for anything, come on up. We love to pray with you, church. And we love to be there in this moment. Have a wonderful Sunday. Remember, if God is for you, there is no one who can come against you.